Oh, that was, he touched me. Well done, Alinda. Thank you very much. And thanks for the team. Man, they are pulling it together. You guys are doing it every week somehow. They're pulling out all the stops. Thank you for the diligence. Uh, John leading the hymn and Alinda. She's kind of that uh, utility player. And, uh, and Mark back there, thank you. Other than me messing up the order or something, it always seems to work somehow. And Mark, thanks for all the work putting this together this morning. That was, not, uh, that was not easy. Thank you. If you have a Bible, turn to Titus, if you would. Kids are making their way to Children's Church right now. And that's a four-year-old fourth grade. Head down there. And I think you'll have a good time. Uh, it's Titus chapter 1. I, I titled it, it's actually, I think it's like an oxymoron, uh, grace-filled confrontation. Like, which is it? Is it grace-filled or is it confrontation? It's both. Uh, it's like something being seriously funny. Well, which is it? Um, I was walking, I remember I was walking the hallway of my last church. I was walking to this little kid, and we walked by a, uh, a defibrillator that was on the wall. And this kid looked at it, he goes, an emergency defibrillator? What other kind of defibrillator is there? And I'm like, kid, that is smart. Yeah, you're right. And I guess if you're needing that, it's always going to be an emergency. Well, we have uh, the title today is Grace-Filled Confrontation. It's in Titus 1. I hope you're still reading through it. Just familiarize yourself big picture with, uh, with Titus. There's that introduction uh, from 1 to 4. Uh, depending on your translation, I have the English Standard Version, and it actually indents paragraphs and separates for you. I know the New American Standard does a symbol, so you can at least see it, and there's other ways as well. But there's the introduction, and then five through, uh, five through nine was a little bit about qualification of elders. And then it says in verse 10, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers especially those of that circumcision party. They must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, these Cretans, they're always liars. They're evil beasts and they're lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. They rebuke, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Father, I'd ask that you would bless the reading of the Scriptures today, and as we look into, I pray you give us wisdom and introspection as we look at our own lives in light of this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. So here it is, uh, an interesting passage, 10 to 16, that is directly for elders in handling dissension within the body, specifically dissension in topic in uh, theology, when something's being taught that shouldn't be taught. That is directly the subject of this in Titus 1, 10 to 16. We're going to extend the application of it out more. The application of it, we're going to talk about confrontation when necessary, when we have to confront one another in our family, or our work environment, or at school, or with a neighbor. We're going to apply this a little bit more generally. Do you remember when uh, the story, at least, or you might have remembered when it happened, it was March of 1990, when George Herbert Walker Bush made a public attack and pronouncement that he hated broccoli? Does anyone remember that? Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, I mean, he, like, he really went after it. He's like, I will not have broccoli on Air Force One. In fact, this is what he says, I do not like broccoli, and I haven't 
liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States and I'm not going to eat it anymore. So he then said, this is the last statement I'm going to make on the subject of broccoli. There were truckloads, there were actually 10 tons of broccoli being shipped to Washington, D.C. by the Broccoli Growers Association. He didn't know who who he was up against. Um, And he said, he goes, I will not meet your caravan. He said, Barbara, being a broccoli lover, she is welcome to go out and speak to you, but I will not. (laughs) As simple as a, I don't like broccoli, he all of a sudden had this huge group of people. I don't know what they did with the broccoli. And by the smell, do you even know when it goes bad? I think it just, I I think it just, as always, smells bad anyway. um, Obviously, I'm on the president's side on this one. Amazing how what we can say can get us into a little bit of trouble. What we can say, we don't realize quite the significance, possibly, of what it actually can do and the damage that maybe can happen and maybe a little bit of fun when it's dealing with broccoli, but maybe not so much when we're dealing with politics or religion or Christianity. Look again at 10 to 11. Look at this setup. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Look how bold verse 11. They must be silenced. They're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Now, understand what's happening. The home church, which is what this was, so we say ruining families, immediately we're thinking they're in here, then they go home. No, they're, they're learning in the homes. So this, these are little home churches that are taking place, and as they're teaching in this home, they're ruining families because they're not teaching that which they should be teaching. But he had an interesting choice of words. There are many who are insubordinate, That means they're teaching and they know they're teaching what they shouldn't. That's different than those that are just teaching wrong and don't even know it. Empty talkers. I read a commentary that said, they say something unnecessary and they break the peace. And they're deceivers especially those of the circumcision party, especially that crowd. Those of the circumcision party were very stern and rigid. They conformed to the rules of the past. So they were coming to know Jesus. Then they come into the body where there is freedom and there's freshness and there's grace and kindness and they bring into the body sets of rules and we have to do something a certain way and we need to follow the laws of. What's the response? Yeah, let's deal with them a little. No, they must be silenced. Because they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain? Did we just dip into motive? What's the motive? That is worth us thinking about. There's a friend of mine who had on his mirror, when he woke up in the morning, he always saw it, and it simply said, what is your motive? Because he was struck by the fact that he would do things that were even possibly good things, and they're judging things that he said and did, but he was realizing that his motives were wrong. That's, That's getting deep now. But Paul, writing to Titus, somehow knew they're doing this for shameful gain. I don't know what it could be. I don't know, are they, are they doing it for attention? I know there's a lot today with teaching. Uh, 
you know, the, the church and Christianity and theology doesn't change. So it's one of the few fields where we're teaching what we've always taught. And yet, many of our seminaries, they advance, the, pro- the professors do, in theories and ideas that are fresh and new. Well, fresh and new and theology usually don't go together because the old is right. Theology develops, and it has developed over time, but it doesn't become new. There's not new ideas. I don't know what the shameful gain would be, but they're doing things they ought not to. So at church, home, and work, let's take this. There's division that takes place and motives that are taking place that you're suffering from at school or a sports team, happens in sports teams all the time, the jockeying and the talking and the division. Then you throw in the motives underneath of it. Very difficult. Look instead at Galatians 5. Flip over to Galatians 5 for just a moment. This is what Christ has done for us. Galatians 5, 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. This is the same subject of laws and rules of of the past. Christ has set us free. There is, unfortunately, within the church, and it's in the Baptist church, there's certain groups that are more known for this than others, where holiness is defined and you're set up against a scale where you are considered by the body holy because you're doing certain things or not doing certain things. And so we have this list to live up to, and it becomes so frustrating because the list will change. People aren't usually putting their bad foot forward, so we really don't even know What we have is freedom in Christ. There is a freedom in Jesus, and there is absolutely the possibility that standing next to me could be a guy or gal that has, quote, the most horrible traits anybody could ever have. Their lifestyle, their choice of words and language, how they dress. It is absolutely true that God could look at them more fondly than he looks at me. How's that possible? Well, first, I don't know where they started. This might be really clean from where they were six months ago. I don't don't know. But I do know he looks at the heart. I have to keep asking myself, why is it that Jesus would be seen sitting and spending time with known sinners? I mean, why did he do that? Now, often we say, well, it's because what he was doing was he was showing that this is where the gospel needs to go and that we need to be open to go anywhere and talk to people because they need the gospel. I wonder if it's because he enjoyed them more. I think I can defend that. How much freedom and enjoyment did he have to sit back and just enjoy time with the Pharisees? I don't know that there's much support for that. He was always on the edge in discussion with the Pharisees because they were not liking, he wasn't living up to their standards. Is that awesome? Is that fantastic? Not living up to their standards? Jesus didn't even live up to their standards. Oh, they'd give, they'd give the reasons why. Look at the work that you're doing on the Sabbath. They're criticizing him for that. No, they're criticizing Jesus 
for breaking the law. And they didn't see the hilarity of that. Well, that's what he got every time he spent time with them. You know, if you look at where the triumphal entry, what kicked off all of that, it's the story of Lazarus. He raises Lazarus from the dead, which ignites a firestorm, and which I thought was so fantastic was they want to kill Lazarus now. So there is a heated exchange where they're trying to take care of Jesus. Now, we've got to kill him now. Oh, and Lazarus, we definitely have to kill him. And I could imagine him going, wait, hey, wait a second, what? All I did was lay there. I didn't do anything wrong. I heard my voice. That's all I did was I crawled out. And for that, the Pharisees, why is it? Let's get to the core of the problem with the Pharisees. Why would it be that Jesus would be more comfortable sitting with a tax collector, prostitute, or sinner? Because they're not judgmental. Just accept me for who I am and move me, love me, and move me to where I need to go. But this pointing is exhausting. There's a second point there that says, never forget purpose. This is so good for us. Second point is never forget the purpose. The purpose of confronting somebody, the purpose of calling somebody out, which is what he's being told to do. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. <laughs> Paul's funny. This testimony is true. Like, I've met them. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that's harsh, that they would be sound in the faith. Do you see that balance? So there was, um, it's Epimedes was a philosopher um, hundreds of years before this. Epimedes is the one who said, like they all knew this, they, like many of the great Greek philosophers recognized this guy and gave a head nod to his philosophy and his wisdom. That's who Paul's quoting. And he said, as a Cretan, as a philosopher, he said, oh yeah, we're a horrible group of people. In fact, it became a word, uh, cretize, to cretize. That meant you're a liar. I mean, it just, you became your own word for bad things. That's what this group was. In fact, if you look again at what he says, Cretans are always liars. It's funny that they said that first because that is the word that became a known word of the day. To cretize is to lie. Evil beasts. Lazy glutton is a funny word because in the actual translation, it's they have idle bellies or slow bellies. Slow belly I can relate to after a good meal. When you kind of just kind of sit back and you're kind of in this half daze of that was the greatest meal of my life and I ate too much. So football game goes on. So that's the actual word. If you had a translation, it would be idle belly or slow belly, lazy glutton. Great phrasing in the English to show that. Well, all of that's true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they would be sound in the faith. That they would be sound in the faith. Think too often, I think too often, it's like at work, where you really don't have personally a lot at stake. In church you do, in your family you do more so, but at school, we want to correct somebody to cut them down a notch or two. 
because we're just going to say it. In fact, we have those that will say, hey, I'm just guilty. I just, I speak the truth. I, yeah, that's just what I do. I just, I say the truth no matter what. Well, A, nobody asked. And just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. So that's not the litmus test. So you could take the same phrasing and say, oh yeah, I speak the truth. I always speak the truth to build up, to restore. That's different. We're not to leave the room as a disaster. We speak to restore. So even in this case, which is far worse than anything that we're going to face, where we literally have Titus over these small churches and we have real division taking place and we have some significant damage happening where they are being totally misled with what they believe. I mean, it's bad case. Even in that case, he says, yeah, rebuke them sharply so that they can be restored. Don't cut them loose. That's not the goal. The goal is we want to see them restored. I typed in, um, I typed in confrontation tips in Google. And I didn't look through all the results. There were 8.5 million results in a third of a second. So I didn't make it through all of them. Uh, but I did find one from Case University in Cleveland. Uh, number one in confrontation, as far as a tip goes, uh, gain emotional control. Have emotional control. It's called EQ, the emotional quotient. But interesting, this is the world talking. Number two, express the positive intent. Keep going back to the reason, the positive reason. We're doing this for. This is why. It's not breaking down to break down. There's a purpose. There's a positive movement. I heard a guy, it actually wasn't that long ago, it wasn't here though, was um, criticizing, because they're easy target, Walmart. Because when we were in Cottonwood, which is outside of Sedona, Arizona, we were there for 10 years. And it happened before we got there, but Walmart came to town. And it was the big deal. I mean, they were picketers. We don't want Walmart here. That's big business and all of that. Every one of them shop at Walmart. That is awesome. There was one who was just, he was telling me how terrible Walmart is. I literally, within days, saw him going out of Walmart with a big old cart of stuff. I mean, it was so funny, I couldn't even stop him to show that I saw it. I'm like, this is just like, Lord, I know you handed me a real softball. I'm not hitting it. I'm going to let this one go. We, you know, we confront to confront, and we want to break down, because that's our, our character, sinful Flesh is we want to confront to cut down. He's instructing us that when somebody needs confronted, family, sports team, school, work, neighbor, we confront to build up. We confront to build up. It's a big difference. And that's now also into motive. We win or lose from the inside. This is the third point. We win or lose from the inside. He's showing what's inside of us. He goes, well, listen, let me just say, to the pure, all things are pure. He's almost now saying, okay, I know I said all of that, and this is the pattern I want you to follow through. You really do need to set things straight, and you need to recognize these people are ruining things, and I want you to step up, but relax. To the pure, all things are pure. You're going to be fine because it's within you. You're okay. When you say it, it'll be okay. I know what's coming out of you because I know what's in you. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. 
Okay, verse 15 is a good one again to say this isn't fuel for confronting those of us in this room. We're talking a different level here. We're not talking about confronting on something that's personal, pet, something that's maybe subjective. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, that's who we're talking about. Nothing is pure. But their minds and their consciences are defiled. I mean, I watched the clip of a reporter, and I thought was, I, she, was, she was direct, asking one of these, we'll say, three, four congresswomen, following the hallway just this week, asking, will you not speak out against what Hamas did? I'm like, okay, that wouldn't answer. Out of the United, United States Congress, wouldn't answer the question, wouldn't make the statement. So said it again. Are, no, are you just simply, are you just not going to say that what that was was horrible? Will you denounce what they did? Right up to the elevator, elevator opened, Congresswoman walks in, walks off to the side to hide in the corner, front corner. Don't blame her. Doors shut. How can you not say that what Hamas did was absolute, there was no justification whatsoever. It was pure act of terrorism. I'll tell you why. But the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They may profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good. That's why that happened. We're talking about the struggle that we face in America today when we actually have things going through Congress or being passed or laws that are completely against what you and I believe. There's the battle. It's not the subjective what's going on here. This is, a, this is ruining households. And we're in the middle of it. And what's the answer? More, more arguments? More, more petitions? What do we do when we have this onslaught in America today of immorality and they're not hiding it. They're actually brazen and they're proud of it. Are you guys with me on this? Are we watching the same TV? And I'm like, do you not know enough that you should be ashamed to say that publicly? Because it's becoming the norm and now common sense the rules that God has set place and how he's created things have become no longer the norm, and that's where we live. Confront to restore. We don't want them ruined. We don't want them killed for it. We want to confront to restore. I'm recognizing that inside to the pure, all things are pure, but we're recognizing for many, they're not pure. They're, they are defiled. They're unbelieving. There is one answer today in the world that brings peace. There's only one answer. And you and I know what it is. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that Jesus Christ says, no, we're, you're all sinners. There is no hope on your own. You can't do it. You can't produce peace if you wanted to. You can't take care of all the scars of sin in your life. You can't set a new course. You can turn over a new leaf and you can do it a hundred times. It's the same leaf. There's only one way. It's when we're active with the message of Jesus Christ. Yes, we're going to fight this onslaught 
of immorality and anti-God, anti-Christian. And yes, it's going to produce times in which we have to confront. There's times in which we need to stand up. All of that's true. It all continues. But that's not going to change it. What ultimately changes things is when somebody's brought into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Which means our prayer today is for the church. The prayer today is that you and I are more active with our faith. We stay inside our walls and then we'll find ourselves disagreeing about things that ultimately don't make a lot of difference but keeps us busy. When our eyes are on the outside, We have a world that is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. There is in this community in which we're living, boys and girls that are afraid to go to sleep at night because of abuse that takes place in their room at night. It's happening right in our community. Divorce is an epidemic. The broken family, everything's to break the family. Many of us have experienced it. We know the pain of it. There is only one answer. I'm all for a class on how to be a better person or how to be a better dad and how to be a best husband you can be. I'm all for any course or book that teaches it, but the problem is deeper than that. The problem is Jesus Christ being alive within us as a church, that the Holy Spirit enlightens us to speak the good news of the gospel boldly to a world that needs it. Then they'll change. Not because they follow our rules, and not because they're following what we do or because they're afraid of our vote not taking place or not for those reasons. If you look at Israel, I'll end with this thought. If you, if you look at Israel, the, the northern, way northern part, uh, I think it might have been the first time I went all the way up there just this last March. Uh, There's snow skiing up there. It's just a beauty. And you're right on the border of Syria. I mean, that's like you can see Syria from there. It's actually some of the most valuable land. Well, it is the most valuable land that Israel has is of the northern part. You know right now this battle that's taking place here, this uh, northern part of Gaza, which is just right there, uh, Tel Aviv, which is Joppa, by the way, That's where Jonah was. Uh, Little Joppa is on the north side of Tel Aviv. It's really the same city. That's where he got on his boat. All the attention's there, but I promise you Israel is putting as much or more attention up further north, way up at the top. They can't give that up. Well, the reason is very simple. It's geography. It's water. All of their water comes from there the Golan Heights. Without the Golan Heights, there isn't a Sea of Galilee, which means there's no Jordan River. All of the beautiful uh, farming that's taking place all through the valley of the Jordan and all along the Sea of Galilee, it's just gorgeous, the things that's that's, uh, being planted and the the bananas, especially on the uh, east side with uh, Jordan, it's just beautiful fruit and vegetables, all because it's Golan Heights. It's the northern part of Galilee. Because if you have fresh water, and it's nearly unlimited fresh water that's flowing down, and the parks are gorgeous, and the hiking trails, and all that, and it makes its way all down, and it fills the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee makes its way down to the, to the Jordan. Until you get down to the Dead Sea, because there's no outlet. The lowest place on earth, the Dead Sea, is the most worthless water you can imagine. There is no use. I think it's the third salt. That's why you go out there. You don't have trouble. You're never going to sink, right? You float. How many of you floated? In? Janet, you've been. Yeah, you guys have been there. Um, the lesson for us is the freshness of the water 
when you and I on a regular basis go before God through our faith in Jesus Christ and that freshness of His Word cleanses us and keeps going, it keeps going. You don't stop it up. can't stop it up. It gets stale. It keeps going and it flows through us into the lives of people around us. There was selfish gain. They were defiled. They were ruining households. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. You got to stop that like right now. You got to stop that to restore them into the relationship with God, that beautiful flow that goes through us. Now, all of a sudden, Conflict, yeah, it's conflict. I think it's healthy. It's that's what we do, right? I mean, that's what our families are. It's always button heads as a family in a sports team. Who knows what happens in that locker room? But they come out as a team, right? They have to. And what a beautiful, beautiful picture here of confrontation that we confront grace-filled. We can only do it if we're grace-filled. So tomorrow, I'm encouraging you again, and whether you do our daily bread or maybe you have an app where the reading drops into your email or you're alerted by a text, however that happens, let me encourage you again when you do that. It's not merely just a reading. It's allowing God's Word to flow in you and through you. Makes its way from the northern parts of Galilee and flows fresh through you, cleanses you for the day, but then also flows through you into the lives of people that you talk to throughout your day. Pray with me right now, if you would. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and salvation that we have through him. For those today who don't know you, I pray that they would before they leave. Talk to one of us. Heavenly Father, I pray that we walk in your grace, the freshness of your grace, the rest of this day, tomorrow as we begin every day this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me right now? Why don't we stand together?